Welcome to this week's episode of Being Human. Delighted to say I'm here with Lloyd Roberts. He is the co-founder of Loan Pro, which is a, a lending software platform, and the author of G Cubed, uh, an extraordinary book, and uh, your your story, and I suppose a personal, uh, yeah, you're the philosophy you've developed to uh, getting the most out of life. So, uh, Lloyd, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Richard. Pleasure to connect with you and everyone today. So, I mean, the LoPro is obviously a very successful company. As I understand it, you're you're sort of in charge of all aspects of, of revenue for LoPro, um, but you've also become a an author. So, so tell us a little bit about how you came to be, yeah, right, writing this book, G Cube. Yeah, well, great question. Thanks for that. You know, for the last 15, 20 years, my two brothers and I have been in the business world, and we've been trying a bunch of different things and. In all candor, most of the things that we tried didn't actually pan out. Uh, some of them failed. Some of them we just pivoted from company two to company three and used the profits from company two to to iterate and adjust into something that that met our needs bigger or, or better and would allow us to be able to grow a little bit bigger. And the truth is, uh, I had thought for about 20 years, if my bank account became a certain size, there's enough zeros behind it, that it would be the final you know, nail in the coffin, so to speak, to have me achieve personal fulfillment. And we achieved that. And we we achieved much more than I had anticipated that we would in that specific category. And I found it to be a little bit lackluster. Now, don't get me wrong, pretty great, you know, when you when you don't have to worry about how you're gonna put food on the table or diapers on your kids' butts or you know, you have some some extra luxuries and conveniences. And if you want to order DoorDash or something like that, you can do that without without worrying what else are we going to need to adjust in the budget. But it didn't actually provide the personal fulfillment that I was looking for. And at the same time, my younger sister was uh, on her on her way out of this world. And we didn't know exactly when she would go, but she was fulfilled. She was happy and it created this paradox in my mind of, wait a minute, maybe the the bill of goods that we are all too often sold of obtaining a life of ease and comfort, you know, get to the spot that, you know, as soon as fill in the blank, then I will, ah, that that ease and comfort that we're all too often sold, maybe that wasn't the, the path to fulfillment and happiness in this life. I hesitate even using the word happiness because it's so branded by companies like Disney, right? That we get a little bit confused on what the definition of happiness is. So I like to lean into it in the category and call it personal fulfillment, right? And it's different than ease and comfort, right? So I went on this journey of my own to try to discover, you know, what is the formula? What is the recipe to become personally fulfilled? And so, you know, I I read what I could, I listened to what I could, I went to seminars, and this filled my spare time for a number of years. And it was much like I found a, a very delicious cake. And I was like, oh my goodness, this cake was is wonderful. I, you know, who who baked this cake? And I would go and we would talk about the sugar and how how awesome sugar is and all the things you can do with it. And then we talk about other ingredients, salt and flour and all these really cool ingredients. And then I found myself longing to say, well, great. I'm I'm super excited to understand what all of these ingredients are that made up this wonderful cake. But what's the recipe? In what order do you mix them? How long do you bake them? I want to make sure that I don't take the the ingredients for the frosting and and stir it into the batter and then pop that all in the oven. I'm not going to get out the result that I'm necessarily looking for, right? How long do you bake it? When you pull it out, how long do you wait for it to cool? You know, what do you mix next to to smear on the frosting? And I felt like the 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 overarching reply was, well, everybody is their own chef. And so you need to decide for yourself on the cake that you should you know, on what the ingredients are, when you mix them, and ultimately what the right recipe is for you. And that didn't really sit well with me. I'm like, well, I want that cake. That's the cake I want. There has to be a way for me to replicate that, 
right? I'm in the software world. I know how it works, right? We string ones and zeros together. We write code. We build something. And to reinvent the will every single time something is needs to be built, it didn't make logical sense to me. So I went on this journey to discover a recipe or a personal fulfillment formula that could be replicated across everybody on this planet, regardless of your age, gender, ethnicity, sexual, you know, preference, whatever, whatever things that we often want to narrow who we are and put ourselves in a specific camp, pull all those barriers down and give me a formula that will work for anybody to increase their level of overall fulfillment. That is what uh, put me on this journey and what ultimately had me write the book called G Cubed uh, with the subtitle of the only formula that you'll ever need to become personally fulfilled. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, and, and we'll get to the formula. And as I said, before we came on air, I've, I've, I've also been through the G4, G cube formula, but I'm interested was, so, so you saw your sister, you know, without the same level of material wealth that you had, and yet she was successful. And was there, was there like a, a particular moment in all of that where you were like, okay, I'm, I'm going to do something different here. I'm going to, I'm going to find another way. Yeah, so her and I talked quite a bit. We weren't able to be physically in each other's presence for the, the three or four years before she passed, right? We couldn't be within six feet of each other. But we talked on the phone quite a bit. So when I was one day I was driving home from work and I called her. She lived down in Texas and I'm here in Utah. And I I asked her how she was doing and the, the typical pleasantries at first. And she said, fine. And then after about 10 minutes, I heard this beeping sound in the background. And I'm like, wait a minute are you in the hospital? And she said, oh yeah. And I said, wait a minute, when we started this call, you said you're fine. And she goes, yeah, I'm feeling better now. And I said, uh, okay, so are they going to let you out? And she goes, well, I have a fever of 106.8. So probably not anytime soon. And I said, how are you feeling fine if you have a, hundred, a fever of 106.8? And she said, after you get above about 106, your body calms down and, and I, I'm not in nearly as much pain. Right. So it was, I was like, wow, how interesting. Like if, imagine yourself, if you're in the hospital yeah, and you got yeah. a fever of north of 106 in the, and very much in the danger zone, you probably wouldn't just tell whoever you're talking to. Yeah, I'm fine. It kind of nonchalant. And I get it at this, this phase in her life, she was in and out of the hospital quite a bit, but it, it's, it stood out to me that, wow, our perception and the way that we choose to see our circumstances dictates everything. It's not our circumstances, right? I mean, it's really quite bizarre that imagine for a moment that you are on a beach, beautiful white sand beach. You got a virgin pina colada or whatever your, your favorite drink is in hand. And it's a beautiful day, wonderful sunset, temperature's perfect. You're alone and you're thinking about your pending divorce. Well, you might, your circumstance might be beautiful, but because of what you're focusing on, you're in a state of, of prison or vice versa. I mean, I know these are extremes, but imagine that you're unrightfully put in prison and yet you're thinking of the good that you can do, an impact you can make, love or whatever that is. You might physically be in prison, but you can mentally be somewhere else based off of your thoughts and what you're choosing to focus on. And it really stuck out for me of, wow, she doesn't have very many days left. And she is choosing to not lean into what the world would call a negative circumstance. Rather, she's choosing to find the beauty in it and squeeze every drop out of life before her inevitable early passing. Right. And, and what was your first move then after that realization? So I, you know, once again, it was a, it was about a two year journey and I, I thought a lot and uh, my younger sister passed and my free time, right. Was I didn't, I hadn't watched network television for a couple of years. Right. And I spent a lot of time attending different types of seminars and trying to really up doing my normal routine of 
running a 5K in the morning. And literally in my mind's eye, I saw a large capital G and to the power of three, almost like it was on a T-shirt. And I audibly said, G cubed. And then it kind of had this weird stabbing and how it wasn't G3, it was G cubed. And when you look at the uh, a capital G to the power of three, you innately know that it is not the summation or the addition of, of three Gs. Rather, it's the multiplication and that there's an invisible multiplying effect, whatever you want to call it, that's baked into the, a G cubed formula that isn't necessarily baked into a, a G3 formula. Right. And so. And. And so what yeah, then you you're left with this question, presumably, what does this mean? Yeah. So I, honestly, I, I ended up calling my buddy and saying and saying, all right, I need to run something by you. I think I think I know the formula. I think it came to me. It's not mine, but I think it came to me and I ran it by him. And he he paused and then he replied, okay. I think I can get behind this. You know, anybody that has elevated levels of gratitude and growth and giving, even though they, they might not have elevated levels of other things, if they have elevated levels of those three, I can't see how they would not be a more fulfilled person. And so we kind of went through what the summation uh, formula is, right? And I think that that's at a subconscious level, that's what we do. It's like we're in high school. And say for a moment, you only have three grades and one's an A, one's a B and one's a C. Well, we innately sum those together and divide by the number of, of classes we have and say, oh, I got a 3.0 or a B GPA, right? Well, I think that we're so preconditioned to think that this is how the formula works that in our own life, if we get a C in the category of gratitude and a C in growth and a C in giving. And then we feel like we should have a C level or an average level of personal fulfillment. And it's, and I think innately it works for you and all my neighbors and my friends. I'm like, well, hey, they're putting good, they're putting okay in or good in. They're getting okay or good out. But for me, it just wasn't working, right? I'd put good in. And I would feel okay, or to put okay in and feel like I'm flunking. And so that's when it came clear to me that, wow, there's an invisible multiplier in this formula. And really, it's not a way, it's not the, the intent is not to highlight that we suck, right? Oh, man, you're no good. You're not doing good in this category. It, on the contrary, it's, it's to highlight Look, in this specific category, if you're only if you're willing to put in an ounce of effort, you're not going to get out of an ounce of results. You're going to get out a pound of results. So it's now worth it. Put in that ounce of effort and see what happens, because you're going to have a great magnifying and multiplying effect that will produce a very different result. You know, for example, imagine for a moment that you are rich, and you're famous, and you're attractive, and, you know, you're just growing left and right and feeding your mind with all these things that are important to you, right? I'm not talking about success only. I'm talking about growth. So let's say you're just killing it in the growth category. On a scale from one to five, we would say that was a five, right? We're tying, tying numbers to the formula. And then let's say that you're also killing it in the giving category, right? You're, you're giving your time and your talent and your treasure based on the phase of your life, but it doesn't really matter. All of those are appropriate different seasons of our life you're clearly a, a five in the giving category. And imagine that in the gratitude category, you're lacking, right? You're driving home and somebody cuts you off. And your first thing is you want to, you want to flip them off and curse at them and even, you know, tell them that you want to pull over and fight them, right? You get home and your loved ones aren't there to greet you. And your natural thoughts are, where all are these ingrateful people that are supposed to love me? Don't they understand what I'm doing for them, right? And well, what kind of life does this person really have, right? Does the summation formula ring true of a five plus a five plus a two, so 12 out of 15 or a B level of overall fulfillment in their life? Or does the multiplication formula make sense? Five times five, 25, times two, 50, 
or an F level of overall fulfillment. And think of it, if you're rich and famous and giving and angry, what kind of life do you have? Well, you have an angry life. But what if that person chose to, they're, they're doing so well into the categories, what if they chose to elevate their level of gratitude, right? Maybe change it from a two to a three. Well, now they go from 50 fulfillment points to 75. What if they went from a two to a four? Well, now they go to 100 fulfillment points or truly fulfilled. You don't need perfection. You don't need to be a five in all categories. You can have one category that you're a four in and still achieve true fulfillment, which is 100 fulfillment points. So for me, the there were multiple components of this that ring true. First, what the three Gs are. And fourth, that there's an invisible G. Call it what you want. Call it grace. Call it mother nature. Call it, you know, call it God. Whatever. It doesn't really matter the label that you want to tie to this invisible multiplier. But the, the concept is, that the objective of this life is not to obtain a life of ease and comfort. Rather, the objective of this life is truly to become more. Your definition of become more might be completely different from my definition of become more. But that is how we become fulfilled. It's by being grateful. And how do we do that? Well, it's not just flipping a switch and saying, I'm grateful, I'm grateful, I'm grateful, right? Rather, it's the opposite. And I know this is offensive to some, but and so I, I will say that in, in advance. But how do you become grateful, truly? Well, you simply decide to root out all of your entitlements. All of them, right? I'm not entitled to the cash in my bank account. I'm not entitled to have my spouse show love in the way I want him or her to show love. I'm not entitled to the temperature in the room I'm currently in or even the blood flowing through my veins right now. If I'm truly not a type entitled to anything, then all of these things that I had held on so tight to and fought for saying, you're not going to steal this from me, right? And even if you're successful in holding on to your entitlements, you don't even feel pleasure. You don't even feel good. You at best feel like nobody stole this from me. You know, dang right they didn't. It's mine, right? That's the emotion that we have. But if we give up all entitlements, now, all those things I mentioned, they become a gift, right? I yeah. see the the money in my bank account as, instead of it mine, I see it as I'm a steward of this money. And what's the maximum amount of good I can, I can influence in this world? I see the fact that I woke up in the morning as a gift instead of, oh, no, it's already, it's already 545 again, right? And so the paradigm naturally shifts. When we root out entitlement, it's naturally replaced with gratitude. That's its only option. Those are your two things. Your two options. You're either grateful or you're entitled. And they can't coexist. Right, right. And and did, did, when you first got this symbol of the three cube, did you know right then that what the three Gs were? Did it come all, all at the same time? Or did you have to figure that out? Yeah, it was a very, I mean, hard to verbalize. It was a very quick stacking, um, right? It was like G cubed, boom, 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 boom. And I was like, whoa, 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 is this, whoa. It was It was a unique experience and one that didn't come with with uh, out much preparation, right? I had spent one to 2,000 hours over the last two years thinking about and pondering on and researching these things. And, uh, but the, the, the coming together of them happened in less than a 10 second window. Wow. And then you, you call your friend and you're like, I've got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was a unique, ex unique experience. And, you know, um, honestly, I, I got excited about it, but it somewhat got put on the shelf for a couple right. months. And uh, as I bring up in the book, there was, uh, I was born blind in my right eye, legally blind. I can still see some motion and some color, but uh, no details, right? And I was born with poor vision in my left eye. But I didn't really mind. I just put a put some glasses on or when I was younger or contacts for most of my teenage years and into my early 40s. And no, no harm, no foul. It's all I knew. It was just fine. Uh, but then one day I got a, a bacteria in my good eye. And I went to sleep with my contact still in my eye. 
I should not have done that. But uh, the bacteria, because the contact was still left in my eye, it was held against my cornea and it ate a hole through my cornea. And it spilled from the, in, from the front of my cornea to the back of my cornea and started eating my cornea away from the inside out. Very painful experience. Um, I went completely blind. And that wasn't even the hard part. The hard part was the pain, right? If you'd have, if you'd have came to me right then and told me, okay, great, I will, the, I will ensure the pain 100% goes away and it'll never come back, but you're going to remain blind in your good eye, I'd have probably taken it. It was that painful. And the, the real problem is I couldn't take any real uh, pain relievers. It was just Tylenol and ibuprofen because if I would have taken other types of painkillers, my eye wouldn't have got the, me the message to heal itself. And so this dragged on for well over a month, uh, not more than 55 minutes of sleep at any given time because I needed to do eye drops every single hour, which were you know highly painful to even take the eye drops. It was like I was... You know, I, I told the doctor, I think I'm allergic to these. And he said, no, you're not allergic to them. They're just somewhat toxic. It's like, oh, OK, well, you know, now we're splitting hairs here. <laughs> right. But uh, in this time of of intense discomfort, about a week into it, I just didn't know what to do. I, there, there didn't seem like any other place to turn. I was trying to relieve some of the pain through breathing exercises. It mildly helped, but nothing was really taking the edge off. And so I just started talking into my cell phone and writing the chapters out, verbalizing them. My daughter and my wife sometimes would type things up for me, but I just took these ideas that were floating around and orchestrated them and, and verbalized them into my cell phone for the first half of the book, and then later went and cleaned it up some. As, a, as an outlet for me to be able to focus on something other than the pain I was going through. Oh, wow. Wow, that's powerful. And, and, and you had helpers with the eye drops? I did. I did. I had my, my family members, even, even my best friend from high school that I hadn't had a sleepover with in over 20 years. Uh, he's, a, he's a nurse, and he came over and, and administered my eye drops on the top of every hour. And that, that continued for about a month. And then, and then it, we started getting some more space between the eye drops every two hours. Then eventually it was every three hours. And it's, I'll tell you this, it's sure nice to be able to sleep a whole night. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the most like arresting parts of the book for me and touching, you know, when you, when you talked and you talked about your father-in-law offering to do that and you accepting that in acknowledgement of the service he wanted to offer you. Yeah, yeah, that must have uh, taken something um, to get through that. And and so, and did it work? Eventually, it did. the The top of the cornea it it healed up pretty quickly after about two and a half weeks. But the bottom of the cornea did not of the hole didn't get the memo, and so the doctor needed to go in there and cut it out and and then rough it up. And I he put numbing drops in during that, but. Two hours later, when those numbing drops wore, wore off, whoo, that was a that was a painful experience. But it, it did the job, and it and it, in about two and a half more weeks, the bottom half of the hole finally healed up. And I remember the day still that it finally healed in and connected because the pain went from chain, bouncing between a seven and a ten, and it immediately went down to bouncing between a three and a five, and it was. Uh, a very welcomed relief right and so now you can see you can see out of it is the is the vision restored yeah yeah so the the shape of my cornea has changed and the the thickness of my cornea is 35 percent thinner than before i can't wear a contact in the eye anymore hence the glasses i'm wearing right now but yes it won't ever be the same but i can see vision's not quite as good as it was before but it's good and you know i can drive and i can read books and I can do all the things that I need to do. So very, very grateful. Right. Well, there you go. You know, you, you, there's the, there's the gratitude. Um, <laughs> yeah. And when I did it, so I, I did this in the book and it's interesting that the adding it versus the multiplying. So I did, I went through the, uh, the, uh, the exercise and I had, I had a four for gratitude, a five for growth and a one for giving. Ah. So, and then I'm, I come out as a C and I'm like, okay. And then of course you multiply it. And so, so the first time you do it, 
it's out of uh, 15. And then the next time you do it, it's out of 125. And now I'm, now I'm at uh, 20 out of 125 and I'm at an <laughs> F. And that, yeah. and that, and that, and there was some insight there because I thought, yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I feel pretty fulfilled in life. I feel good. Uh, but yeah, that something ring true there that there is, there is a, there's a probably a leap that I could make here. Uh, that I probably wasn't present to before the before I read the book. Awesome! It's a couple things. One, I, I know that five times five times five is one twenty-five, but I think one of the pieces of magic is that perfection's not required, right? And our brain mm. works in a way of bringing things up to one hundred. So the nice thing about the multiplying formula is it's not at a one twenty-five; it's at a one hundred, right? But you're right. Even in a scenario where you're time you're taking a four and times it by a five, and then by a one, you're still only twenty. So instead of the, the, the summation of a C or 10 out of 15, right, 66%, something like that, you're 20 out of 100, and you're, you're well in the flunking realm. Well, and, and that can be pretty kind of offensive. It's like, wait a minute, you're telling me I'm flunking? What, what are you talking about, man? Right? But it's, it's really more of a call of action and saying, wait a minute, you're actually doing quite well in gratitude and you're killing it in growth, clearly. But the giving category, sometimes we get a little bit confused that, the, oh, we have to give a certain amount of cash, right? Mm. We got to go buy our neighbor a, a car because she's a single mother and she needs it more than me. Okay. Okay. Those things could be good, uh, but they're not where we start. We start with giving our time and giving our talent. And it could be, giving is could be as simple as making the choice to be present with those we claim to love, right? Put your cell phone down. Look at them in the eye when they're talking. Don't be thinking about what you're going to say and just waiting for them to have a pause. Rather, listen to them. Ask them about their day and just be present, right? It, it, could, it doesn't necessarily have to be about quantity of time. It could be about quality. I can tell you this. I'd rather be with my wife for one hour of quality time than with her for a dozen hours where I'm you know, dinking around with my phone and she's doing the same, right? So we can give to others and it can be in a way that is untraditional, right? And so realizing that we, we're we really not, not the giver anyways, right? This is more of, I often think that we believe that we need to obtain a level of perfection, give up the addiction that we're struggling with, the crutch we're leaning on. And, and once we do that, then we're, we feel, quote unquote, worthy to have light flow through us to bless our brothers and sisters on this planet. And the problem with that is oftentimes it just doesn't happen, right? Frankly, it's hard to give up what your, your favorite addiction, whatever that is, if it's cigarettes or alcohol or pornography or gambling or, you know, uh, video games, whatever it is. We all have temptations and addictions and crutches that we have or are currently struggling with. And when we focus on those, whatever we focus on expands. And so what I would submit to you and to all of your listeners is table that, put it on the shelf right now, realize, hey, this, this addiction isn't serving me and I don't want it to be who I become in this life, but I'm going to put it on the shelf for a minute. And instead, I'm going to move the giving component in front of getting rid of this addiction. And the way I'm going to do that is four steps. I'm going to ask for light to flow through me. Whatever your higher power is, or maybe it's just Mother Earth or however you want to refer to it, ask this source to trust you enough in your current state to have light flow through you, to be a conduit for that light. Don't even think about the light as your light. Uh, think of it as a higher powers light that has the ability to flow through you to bless others, to give to others. Once you ask, start looking and start listening and realizing you might be inspired to give in a way that is untraditional to you, right? You might be inspired to say a kind word to a complete stranger. You might be inspired to give of your time, talents, or treasures in, in some way that is uncomfortable for you. And then the last step is to take action, remembering that, look, this isn't about the outcome. You're not responsible for if they like it. 
You're not responsible for if it actually met their need or answered their prayer or however you like to verbalize it. This is about you becoming comfortable with giving in the unique ways that you feel inspired to do so. And I can promise you, if you give without expectation, you know, this isn't a business transaction. We've all been guilty of, of, you know, maybe pick your spouse for a moment. Maybe you took out the garbage. Maybe you did some nice acts of service and you did these nice things and you hoped for at minimum something nice to be done back to you. Exactly. And maybe the in your preferred way to receive love, right? Now, what we what what I've learned over the years is that this is more of a business transaction, right? I did this and you were supposed to do that. And when you didn't do it, I felt pain and I got frustrated and I had a big question mark if our marriage is really working out, right? Instead of, wow, what if I just gave without expectation? What if it wasn't a business transaction? What if it wasn't a, a tit for tat, right? What if it was I just loved and gave and let light flow through me to this person that I profess to love? How Would that change anything? Would it change anything for the person that I profess to love? Would it change anything for me? And so the, the whole strategy here is to say, wow, what if you change that one to a five? What if you only focused on that one? You're clearly doing really well on the other two. How crazy is it that if you just changed, if the formula is real, and this is for everyone to decide for themselves, but if it is real, you take that one and you move it to a five, and you become one that is constantly giving of your time, talents, and treasures, you went from 20 fulfillment points to 100 fulfillment points with that one adjustment alone. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what I found find uh, inspiring about this, is, is that potential to, yeah, experience it on another level that I, yeah it's almost like you can't really be con i mean if this is this is correct that it's, it's probably very difficult for somebody at 20 to kind of have a real understanding of what 100 might feel like but i do have a, some inkling that there's a there's a bigger prize <laughs> there and and the other insight for me on the on the giving is i mean uh, of course I do, I do give right i give my time to my kids and to my wife and to my to my business and to my clients and 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 so on but it's it's the being yeah. conscious of it i mean what i never do is ask to be more giving in the world. What I never do is consciously think about how can I be a great giver today? And I think that was, and, and I have focused on gratitude and I have focused on growth, but never that. And it just, just, I mean, I'm sure it's there. <laughs> of course it's there for me. Of course I give, yeah. but am I conscious of it? Do I seek to become a bigger giver? No. And, and that's yeah. what this is set up for me is like, well, what if I were to, to ask, as you say, you know, and seek, opportunities to give awesome. yeah consciously yeah we often think that it's gonna that we have to like calendar our giving no we don't this isn't it's not going to add the hours to your day that you have to focus on giving but maybe that that interaction with your child that you're already doing you're already making the time investment maybe it's you know five minutes of some some real one-on-one -on -one play Maybe it's sharing with them some kind words that we assume they already know, but maybe it's, you know, whispering some sweet nothings. Do you know how much I love you? Mm. Spending time with you this five minutes, it's the best part of my day. You're such a pleasure to be around, right? Where you didn't give them any, you didn't buy them a toy and hand it to them. You gave them of your energy. And when we repetitively do that, yeah, it blesses the recipient, but what a difference for us. What if you do that right before you go to work, instead of rushing out, you take that time and you share that energy and you look them in the eye and you're emotionally available. Just five minutes. You're probably going to be with them during that five minutes anyways. But now you're giving in a in a way that does bless the recipient. But it's it's almost not about the recipient. I mean, in this formula, it's not. It's about you. It's about your personal fulfillment level. And it's trusting yourself enough to understand that light can and will flow through you to bless others and you. It's almost like you're a glow-in-the-dark sticker. All you need to do is have light pass over you. And, and sure, it's still going to do what it does, but you're left with this additional glow that you didn't have otherwise. Yeah, yeah. And I like that what you say about like not, not have this be about 
am I going to, can I give? Because that can feel a bit heavy, right? I mean, can I be a bigger giver? Like, can I, it, it can have a certain sense of heaviness, like, oh, uh, you know, well, have I got the time and what would I do? Blah, blah. But if you just yeah. accept, can I be a conduit for the light, right? There's a very different, uh, different way of uh, conceiving it. Yeah. And so I'm interested then, sorry. Uh, yeah. When you, um, so you start to dictate this book into your, into your phone and, and your wife's helping and you're in this extraordinary pain. When did you start assessing for yourself then what your G score was and, and where were you initially when you started doing it? Yeah, great question. Well, early on in that process, and I think uh, that that same day, I I ran through my current life. I ran through earlier phases in my life, right? And I was in in the in the software world. I was I was uh, testing it, right? Is this really going to work? And then I started doing that with uh, friends and family. On is this work for you, right? Comparing the summation versus the multiplication. And so it was a compare. It was a comparison on two fronts. One, were the G's really the three components that would dictate the overall fulfillment someone would have in this life? And did the multiplying effect was that really the the linchpin or the keystone of what made it all work? Right, the multiplication instead of the summation. So I, I tested it over a thousand times with in my own scenario and with friends and family and got their input on if this was an accurate representation of their overall fulfillment in their life. And it was an interesting experience, right? I had one friend that had kind of given up on one of the G's because he's like, look, you know, there's, we all have, we're all adverse to risk and we all have loss aversion. And we all want to, if we're going to make an investment of any type, we want to get out more than we put in, right? And at a at a subconscious level, if I tell you, give me a hundred bucks and in a period of time, I'll give you a hundred bucks back. You're like, yeah, why would I do that? I'm not going to invest an ounce to get an ounce back later. No, thank you. That seems risky and unrewarding, right? And so the understanding that, hey, in this scenario, you could take your, because you're doing so well in your gratitude and your growth category, but lacking in the giving category, at least how you scored yourself, boy, what if I invested four ounces in the giving category, but it produced, you know, 400 ounces worth of result. Now this is compelling. Now this is like, really? That's a really good rate of return. My ROI is through the roof. Let me actually explore this because that's a great return, right? If I come to you and say, hey, give me a hundred bucks, and in a and in two weeks from now, I'll give you a thousand bucks or four thousand bucks. You would say, I'm gonna really look into this. How is it possible you can do that? Because that's a that's a compelling return on my investment. Right, right. And and did and then your friend your friend started experimenting with with yeah. you know, with more giving. Yeah. They did. So they they first were kind of running through the scenarios in their own life current and past on where they are and were in these three categories and how that aligned with their overall fulfillment and then we started to build out the seven step uh, process on how to actually go through this process of of identity you know first raising your standard i don't know if we have time to go into all of them today but you can have these worksheets are found in the book and you can also go to gcubeformula.com and you can download these worksheets for free, right? And it will, it'll be a fillable PDF if you go to the website, uh, download them, not a problem. You can save it, download them as many times as you want, but it will walk you through a seven-step process of how to go and make these adjustments. So we've focused heavily on step two, which is identifying what your G scores are and therefore identifying your low score. And in this example, let's say your low score is giving, we now know which, which G we're going to focus on. We're not going to focus on the gratitude and growth in this, in this worksheet. We'll focus on your low score. And go, we go through the process of identifying what your current standard is or your current story, right? It's kind of hard to know what your story is. Like, uh, what do you mean? I didn't know it was my story. I thought that's just how it was, right? We often think that uh, things just are what they are and we don't realize that there are story, right? And so identifying your story is simply asking yourself a question. And the question is, 
If everything was as it should be in given category, what would that look like? Whatever your answer to that is, is, is your story, right? I was supposed to have, you know, I'm at this age in my life, I was supposed to be married and have a good career and, you know, two and a half kids and a white picket fence. And I don't, I'm not measuring up to what, where I should be. And we should all over ourselves, right? And so this is identifying your story. Well, sometimes the next step is to realize, okay, great. What, what adjustment do we need to make? And there's really three options. First, there's the option we always hear about that's preached at a variety of pulpits, which is step up, make it happen, you know, rise to the occasion, so to speak. And it's a very important one. And it's probably the most likely one that you need to explore. That's why it's first, but it's not the only one. And so if you've ever done that, you've sometimes realized that that didn't give you the impact you're looking for. Sometimes it does, but not all the time, probably half the time, right? And But we have two more options. The second option is to raise your standard. Think of a totem pole and think that you're low on that totem pole. On that same vein, in that same lane, you raise your standard. Imagine that you have a standard that isn't currently causing you pain, but isn't serving you either. Maybe your standard is it's okay to play video games for 10 hours a day, seven days a week. Okay, you're going to likely very easily stay with, stay above that standard, right? And so you don't get immediate pain. But is that standard serving you long time, long term? What if you raised it? What if you said something like, weekdays I play vi zero video games, but on the weekends I can play three hours a day, right? Raise your standard and then elevate your life to meet your standard. And then the last one is the yeah, of the, the options of how to, to change your standard is one that hardly anyone thinks about. And it's the ability to change your standard. Uniquely different from raising your standard, right? It's not on the same totem pole. It's not in the same lane. It's completely independent. This is when we tie our story, our standard to the actions or behaviors of somebody else. We do it all the time, right? Oh, my life hasn't quite turned out like I wanted to. So I'm going to for dang sure make sure my kids does. They're going to get great grades and they're going to become a doctor and they're going to stay active in the religion that I'm a part of and whatever. They're going to serve their country in this capacity. We project on them that they need to act or react in a certain way for us, for our standard to be met. And if they don't, well, then we feel pain. So who in their right mind would tie their story, their standard to the actions or behaviors of somebody else? Well, we all do it. And why do we do it? Because we don't realize that we have any other options. So just the realization that, wow, I don't have to tie my standard, my story, my pain and pleasure to the actions and behaviors of anybody else. Rather, I can tie them to myself Imagine for a moment that you aspire to have your child become a doctor. I was I was born and raised in poverty, and I'm the I'm a working class guy, and I want more for my child. So we put that standard on them, and then if they decide to go be a comedian or go be an artist, we feel pain. Well, why do we do that to ourselves? What if we chose to change what our standard was, and it no longer was my child is going to be a successful doctor. We change it to, I am going to love my child unconditionally. And every time I see him or her, I'm going to express honest love with my child. Wow, we've just changed our standard from something external, actions and behaviors of somebody else, to something internal that we can control and decide for ourselves. Yeah. So there's a there's a couple more steps in the process. Um, we're we're now changing the standard. The book goes through how you do that now, right? Writing your new story in the software world that I come from. This is called writing your project spec, or writing out how you want the the software to work, right? You're not a programmer. You don't know how to do the programming, and you don't need to. You simply need to write out what you want your new story to be, and have some fun with it. It's it's yeah. a, a pretty amazing process. I mean, just last week alone, um, Loan Pro, our software company, it's uh, we were just ranked the third fastest growing company across all sectors in, in the state that we're in. And we also were 
recently recognized as a unicorn. And so pretty cool stuff, right? Well, you, you would think our software is pretty cool too. But just last week, we had between 1,500 and 2,000 hours of programming to edit bugs and add new features and adjust code. Well, heck, that's a lot of time. How is it possible that something so good could require so much bug tweaking and fixing and feature adding? Well, this is exactly how our unconscious minds work as well. And sometimes we we don't realize that, right? We we think of, you know, I'm holding my cell phone in my hand right now. We look at it, we clearly understand that there's something tangible I'm holding here. And it's the hardware, pretty easy to identify. It's like our bodies. We all have our mm. own hardware, right? They're pretty cool. They're pretty amazing pieces of technology, these bodies of ours, much like an iPhone is, right? But an iPhone is nothing more than an expensive paperweight if it doesn't have the software. We combine the hardware and software. This is an amazing piece of technology where we can swipe to buy and view videos and learn and all these amazing things. Talk to someone, you know, heck, you and I are seven hours apart talking yeah. from different sides of the planet right now, right? All done through technology. But even when you're holding your cell phone in your hand and you hold this technology that's combined with the hardware is combined with the software, you would never call your cell phone you. You would never say this is me. Rather, they are the hardware and software that are intended to serve the user. And you're the user. And it wasn't until just a couple of years ago that I, I always knew I wasn't my body. I always knew I wasn't my hardware. But I actually thought I was my software. I thought I was my mind. And so when I would mess up in my own definition, and I would do something stupid, and I would repeat it. And I'd be like, oh, I don't want to do this. Why am I so dumb? How could I do this again? Won't I ever learn? I thought that was me that was failing again and again. I now realize that that was the coding of my software. And if I don't like the outcome of how my software is coded, well, instead of throwing the software away or beating myself up, I rather say, huh, I don't like that outcome. Maybe I should tweak the code of my mental software. This seven-step process is how you go about tweaking that code because you're not your hardware and you're not your software. You're something independent of that. Call it what you will. I like to call it my I am. You might want to call it your spirit or your yeah. soul, but it's the user of, these, of the hardware and software. It's not you. So when the result is not what you want, Oh, how could I pick up that bottle again? I, I, told, I told my loved one I, wasn't, I was done with that phase of my life, right? You can say, huh, that wasn't me. That was the coding of my mental software. And it's not serving me right now. So maybe I should go through a process of tweaking the code. Not everything, just this one thing. I'm going to go and tweak the code. And I'm going to walk through the seven-step process of adjusting my state identifying in the category what my current story is, my G-scores, my story, the tool I'm going to use to adjust it. We just went through those three yeah. tools of raise your life or raise your standard and then raise your life to meet it or change your standard. Decide what you'd want your new story to be, then hand the project spec to the programmers. The programmers are your supporting rituals. They're the actions. It's where the rubber meets the road, right? It's where all things happen. And then put a date on it. It's It would be unwise for an alcoholic to say, I'm not going to ever consume alcohol again in my life. Done, right? Rather, if you have ever gone to an AAA meeting or something like that, you realize that they decide that they're not going to consume alcohol today. And then when they wake up in the morning, they decide that they're not going to consume alcohol today, Right. And so when you set your supporting ritual, it's for a limited time frame. It's not for mm -hmm. a time of how long you would like to do that supporting ritual. It's for the period of time that you know you will do that supporting ritual. So if you don't want it, you're like, you know, what? I think I can, I can not do this action or do this action for a month. Okay. Well, if you think you can, you should probably shorten it up. Well, I know I can for five days. Great. Then put right down that the date that you'll do that to, that you know you'll do it to. And when that date comes and goes, you can then decide if you want to keep doing the same supporting ritual or edit, tweak, and adjust. 
and then start the process again. I love that. I love that as a, as a guideline for, for starting any kind of habit, right? It's not like, could I do this? Could I meditate for 20 minutes a day? It's no, no. If you've got any doubt at all, I, I will meditate for one minute. I can meditate hundred percent. I'm sure I can do it for one minute. Okay. Start there. Like start yeah. at a place where you're a hundred percent confident you'll do it. Yeah. That's, that's, that's very important advice because and I think in, uh, applying that to myself, the number of times I've attempted to start a habit and the standard's been way too high and I've failed just too often in the early phase to ever get the habit off the ground. Yeah, it's, uh, it can become daunting and we, we hold ourselves to a high standard. You know what? And that's why everybody starts, you know, at the beginning of the new year, they set these lofty goals and statistics show that over 70% of them are broken within seven days. Wow, well, they they said, this is what I'm going to do this year. And then they didn't see the results they were looking for. They didn't come fast enough. And then they threw in the towel, right? So set a shorter goal. What if you decided, you know what? I'm going to work out five days this week. That's it. Five days this week. I'm not setting a goal for the rest of my life or for the rest of the year. It's for this week, five days. And it gives you a little bit of flexibility, right? I'm not saying I'm going to work out for two hours, seven days a week. Well, I'm probably not going to do that. So, but I know I can work out five days this week. I don't know what I can do next week, but this week I can work out five days. Yeah, no, I yeah. love that. Fantastic. I know, I know you've got a commitment, uh, so we're coming up on time here. But um, yeah, this has been this has been a brilliant conversation. Um, I'm just reading the book for myself. I, I, I got I got a huge amount out of it, and I can really see how. This is going to give me the impetus to get get on it with the giving. Any any final messages as we we climb, as we close out here? Yeah, you know, our my wife and I are really at the stage that we're we're looking to make an impact in this in this world in a positive way, right? We don't we don't need to worry about the financial side anymore. Um, we would love to help anybody that is looking to elevate their level of personal fulfillment. Uh, I still have my day job. My wife has been a life coach, quote unquote, for years, and she has some people that work with her. So if you're looking to get assistance on implementing the G-cubed uh, strategy in your own life, right? we have some paid packages. And frankly, we have some volunteers that do this for free as well to help give back in a certain way. So go to gcubedformula.com. Feel free to, to download the worksheets. Uh, the book's on Audible. I did it myself. So I, that was a passion of mine. I really wanted to do the Audible. And then, of course, the, the book's on Amazon and a num number of other places as well. Um, also, one last plug is one of the things that we are trying to do is, is elevate the level of gratitude, growth, and giving an, among the affluent. I know that sounds narrowed, but in the country I'm in, in the U.S., on a global scale, 99% of the U.S. population is considered affluent on a global scale. Pretty crazy, right? Uh, but that's how, it, that's how it works. So and the way we're doing that is combining a country like the United States that is rich in resources on an average with a country like Cambodia that is poor in resources but was just ranked the happiest people on the planet for the second row, second year in a row. So my that. older brother, we asked him to retire from being a professor at a, at, a, at a local university and to run the new public charity that we just launched. Our objective is to lift 100,000 Cambodians out of extreme poverty. So me and my two business partners at Loan Pro have, have uh, committed millions of dollars to this effort, but it's twofold, right? There's a lot of charities out there that are building wells in, in Africa or a, a number of amazing things out there. Well, our objective is twofold. One is to increase our own level of gratitude, growth, and giving. And the way we're doing that is through full immersion service vacations to Cambodia, where you can go and actually serve the people that are living in the dump, not by the dump, in the dump, right? And they, they're living on you know, on less than a dollar, 24% of their whole country is living on less than a dollar 90 a day as a household. Typically, that's grandparents, parents, and kids all in the same little shack. And a shack would be generous from our, you know, a shed in, in America would be considered a nice home in Cambodia. Took my family out to Cambodia just three months ago. We spent two weeks out there and really got to know the people and 
helped restore some schools and spent time with the families living in dumps and uh, on these, you know, right next to the riverbeds. And it's it's definitely a paradigm shift. And uh, it uh, it clearly identifies what first world problems are and how they how they differ from third world problems. But why are they so happy? How is it possible that a people that have so little can still be so happy? And we would love to share the resources we have with them and have them share the gratitude they have with us and create instead of two parallel lines, squeeze those together, make a circle in a spiral on an upward trajectory that we can all rise together. All boats rise with a rising with a rising tide. So if you want to get involved with the the, the public charity called Become More, we invite you to do so. However, it is you would like to get involved and also would love to help you out in implementing the G cubed strategy and formula in your own life. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Lloyd. And uh, yeah, we'll make sure we get the links to, to in the episode description for both the, the charity and G cubed. Right. Well, thanks once again. Um, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much. It's been truly my pleasure. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.